Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to this morning's uh, resonance presentation. Today it's going to be Dr. Amelie Müller, who is going to talk about post-operative delirium and the necessary treatments. And this talk will be accompanied by Professor Urs Schwarz, who is a, uh, um, a staff neurologist who is going to help us with the discussion regarding uh, ideal management and therapy of the delirium. Thank you very much. So, um, imagine we have a 73-year-old patient who had an emergency <coughs> operation. Um, it was a big operation with a big laparotomy. Um, the, the length of the operation was about six hours, and today is the second post-operative day. During the day, the patient was a little bit um, sleepy, but you could, you could wake him up but it was difficult. And now during the night, the nurse is calling and he's agitated. So first, what is the definition of the delirium? The delirium here, the ICD-10 definition, is a perceptual and atten uh, attentional deficit. That means um, if, if the patient has problems to focus. Then um, the, he can also have a cognitive deficit. Uh, that means if um, he is disorientated regarding time, place, or persons. And um, he can have psychotic features as hallucinations. Then he can also uh, have dis disturbed psychomotor behavior. Uh, that means also if there is a switch between hyper or hypoactivity, but we will talk about this later. Um, then a disturbed sleep and wake cycle. And the most important point is acute beginning with a fluctuating course. This is really the most important point and we will also talk about this later. So the delirium is a form of encephalopathy. Um, from the epi epidemiology in population, the prevalence is about uh, 0.2 to 2 percent in hospitals around 56% and in intensive care, it's way higher, of course, it's um, 70 to 87% uh, 87%. The mortality, as you can see, there's a big range, but there are a lot of publications and um, also the patients are really different. That means some patients are operated or had, had different risk factors, so uh, but it's a big number, it's between 22 and 76 percent. So, um, I don't know if you remember, before we always learned that there are subtypes, that there is a hyperactive uh, and a hypoactive or mixed type of delirium, and that, that there is a productive and unproductive type, that means with hallucination and without hallucination, but that's wrong. It's always a mixture between everything. From one second to another, the patient can be sleepy, and the next one, he's agitated. One second, he has um, hallucinations, and the other, uh, he hasn't any. So, back to our patient. As we said before, 70, 73 years old, big operation. It was an emergency operation. Um, now it's the second post-op day during the day. The inflammatory uh, parameters were high, and now he's agitated. So what kind of questions that we, uh, do we have to ask ourselves as doctors? We want <coughs> to know, has he alcohol addiction or uh, history um, that he drinks a lot of alcohol? What kind of medication does he take? What kind of comorbidities ha has he? Are there any other differential diagnosis to delirium that we can, um, yeah. And we also have to, to think about hallucination. If, his, um, if the patient is looking around and doesn't have a fixation, or if he is um, going up in the air or something like this, we also have to think about a hallucination. So the next point, um, what kind of risk factors are etiology can lead to a delirium. There are different etiologies or risk factors, the age, uh, stress also, or if the patient already had a delirium, 
a big operation or trauma, um, if it was an um, uh, emergency operation or if it was very long the operation, if the uh, patient has a lot of pain, um, comorbidities and also from the etiology big points or important points um, is toxic, that means drugs or an alcohol abuse, uh, but also metabolic and endocrine, uh, such as um, hypo or hyperthyroidism, uh, uh, uremia, hypoemia, uh, dehydration, electrolyte disturbance, um, and such perhaps as here, uh, a septic patient um, that has fever or also hypoxemia can lead to a delirium. Now, we wanted to ask ourselves, okay, what is with the patient? And we said, okay, we want to know if there's any alcohol problem or not. So we do the cage. The cage is, um, the C stands for cut down. That means if um, the patient ever had the impression that he has to reduce his alcohol consumption. A is uh, for annoyed. Uh, it's if someone annoyed you uh, because he criticized um, your alcohol or drinking behavior. G is for guilty. Um, that's if patients ever felt guilty after drinking alcohol. And E is for eye opener. It's when you wake up and suddenly you feel the urge to drink alcohol. So if the cage is higher than two, then you have the suspicion that perhaps there is an alcohol problem. So if you have this suspicion, then you have to uh, take a closer look to his medical and alcohol um, history, even perhaps ask relatives or friends if the patient is okay with it, uh, if there are any things that are a little bit uh, different or special. Uh, perhaps you can also do a lab uh, with transaminas, um, the MCV, MCH, um, the pancreas amylase, or uh, cholestase. Then we said also that we wanted to know if uh, the patient does take any drugs that can lead to uh, delirium. So the medication or drugs that are important for us, because there is a long, long list, so it's just some of the drugs, are uh, antibiotics, antidepressants, antihistaminica, beta blocker, benzodiazepines, uh, immune suppressors, ondansetron, and tramadol. So during all the, this thing, um, we can do also screening methods. This is, uh, these are the nurse that do the screening methods. First, they do a DOS, a delirium observation screening scale. So if the DOS is higher than three, I will tell you later what the DOS is, um, they will do the MSQ and the CAM. The MSQ is a mental status questionnaire, and the CAM is a confusion asse assessment method. So the DOS is an instrument with 13 verbal and non-verbal behavior cr criteria, and the DOS um, gives a rough estimation uh, of the total picture. So it's an early recognition for patients in non-intensive care. I don't want to talk about the patients in intensive care, but uh, with intubated patients or in patients with intensive care, you can also do, or they do the RAS, the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale, and the ICDSC. So here, um, after the DOS is higher than three, as I said before, they do the MSQ, and the MSQ is to check the orientation and the concentration of the patient. Later, they will do also the CAM. The CAM is also to instrument and to diagnose the de delirium. And if the CAM is positive, then you are, or you have a high suspicion um, that that there is a delirium. And but you also always have to think ab about the differential diagnosis also. And you can do, or you should do, a lab. And the lab also the nurses can do. So here yeah, the was said, we have our uh, own algorithm. Um, it's also here if you want to take it later. Um, and it's the difference between um, patients with 
an alcohol problem or history and without. So, as we said before, we do always the cage. It's always the physician, I forgot before to tell you, it's always the phys physician in the first 24 hours that has to do with every patient a cage. So if the cage is below to two, uh, but you, he is agitated or you think there is something, perhaps he has a delirium, then during all this time also the, the nurses, as I said before, do the DOS. And if the DOS is higher than three, they do the, the CAM and uh, the, the MSQ. And they will also do a lab. And of course, they would call us and say, OK, we think that the patient has a delirium. So if now we are sure that there is a delirium, then of course, we have to think, why is there delirium? And here also, we can have a fluctuation. Um, our patient has um, high infectious parameters. It was a long operation. Um, it was an emergency operation. And perhaps the patient is septic. And so this perhaps is now the reason why he, he is delirious. And next, uh, we treat him with antibiotics. And perhaps that's the next reason why he is delirious. And perhaps the antibiotics make a renal fa a failure. And that's the next reason. So there's always a fluctuation of the symptoms, but also of the etiology. Um, so we have to treat, of course, the reason why there's the delirium. Um, and we have to do a treatment with medication if there are also any hallucinations, but uh, we will talk about this later. If there, are alcohol pro if there is an alcohol problem or the cage is two or higher than two, um, then, as we said before, we have to talk with the patient, perhaps with the relatives, do a lab, and we also have to um, talk with the patient to, to put some rules. That means um, it's really forbidden to give the patient alcohol. Um, and yeah. and um, we have also to do a little note in the kissing. So to the pathophysiology of, um, of the delirium. Um, here you can see the brain stem. And in the pons, you see the reticular formation. The reticular formation coordinates all signals and neurotransmitters. That means the formatio contains cells that release all kinds of neurotransmitters. Here are some examples of the most important that are also really relative uh, for the delirium. Um, and um, yes, they, they release all kinds of neurotransmitters and spread them in the whole brain. <laughs> Um, and influence the activity of the cortex. And as we said before, the delirium is a form of a encephalopathy. So the main problem of this encephalopathy is the dysfunction of astrocytes. I will show you the next picture why the astrocytes are important. And also the disbalance of the neurotransmitters um, are the reason why there can be a problems in the vigilance and uh, le the lucidity. So here you see a presynaptic, presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic, and here the astrocytes. Um, I forgot to tell you before that here perhaps the glutamate um, has an excitatory signal. So here, in our example, we talk about glutamate. So the presynaptic um, neuron uh, releases through the vacuoles the glutamate. In, um, and then the postsynaptic receptors, um, they, they take the glutamate, and there will be a, re a release of a, a action potential. So the astrocytes are like a vacuum cleaner, and they, they take back the glutamate and they transform it to glutamine to reactivate it and to give it back to the presynaptic neurons. Um, so it's like a, a circle. So if the astrocytes, um, there is a reason why they don't work at the beginning uh, here, there is too much glutamate. And after some time, there will be um, 
less production of the glutamate and we don't have enough. So what can be the problem or what can be the reason of the swelling of astrocytes? We, we talked about it before. Um, it can be uh, perhaps uh, ammonia due to bleeding. Um, it can be uh, through uh, sedatives uh, such as benzodiazepines. Hyponatremia can also lead to uh, <coughs> astrocyte swelling or dysfunction. The uh, physiology, pathophysiology of the alcohol withdrawal syndrome is different. It's also a, um, the problem is also the disbalance uh, between the neurotransmitters. In the first picture in A, you see a person who doesn't drink any alcohol. So there is a balance uh, between GABA and glutamate. GABA is a inhibiting neurotransmitter and glutamate an exciting one. So if a person who, isn't, um, who doesn't drink often alcohol drinks alcohol, um, there is more releasing of GABA. And so um, the patient uh, or the person is a little bit sedated and also uh, euphoric. If um, it's a chronic drinker, then there, there are less receptors that are working. Um, and also another problem is um, that the regularly alcohol consume um, can lead to uh, more distribution of the glutamate. So you have to drink more alcohol to have this sedative uh, euphoric um, result. So you have a bigger tolerance to alcohol. So in D, you see a patient with a withdrawal of alcohol. So you have much more glutamate because it was much more re uh, released and you have less GABA. So we said before, we always have to also to think about differential diagnosis. There is a big, big list. But um, here are some examples. Um, you have to think about epilepsy. You have to think about a stroke or an encephalitis. Perhaps if the patient has pain, neck, or something like that, the men meningitis, and um, intoxication also. So now back to our patient, the 73-year-old man, second post-op day, um, emergency <laughs> operation, lung operation, and high inflammatory um, parame parameters, and his eyes are wandering around, um, and when you come, he's really agitated, and he wants perhaps to, to pull out all his grains. So what would you do? What is what is the treatment? Ah, okay, we, and we know now it's a hallucination. So, um, for the therapy, here is our management, how we uh, treat a patient with a delirium. So, we have um, three big points. We have the prevention, uh, then the treatment uh, on the normal station and the IMC, and the ICU treatment, but we won't talk about the ICU treatment. So if we think that the person or the patient uh, has a high risk for delirium because he has a lot of risk factors or the dose was two or something like this, then you can perhaps uh, begin with dipipirone with a low treatment. Or um, you can also give, if he has uh, anxiety attacks or something like this, a uh, trimester. Um, if the patient is really, um, he has a delirium, so you have to make a differentiation if he is cooperative or not cooperative. So um, if he is a little bit more um, sleepy, <coughs> you work more with um, Haldol, and you can give also if there's sometimes agitation because, as we said before, there's always a fluctuation, the dipipirone. And if it's the contrary and he's more agitated and sometimes sleepy, you, you do the contrary. That means you work first with the dipipirone because there, there's more agitation and uh, you can give Haldol if there are any hallucinations. If the patient is completely uncooperative and dangerous for himself or for others, 
then you can work with the Dermicon Perfuso. And it's only a treat, it's not really a treatment, the, the Dermicon Perfuso, it's only a solution for a short time. That means um, if it's during the night uh, on IMC or even a normal uh, station, then you have to stop it at six o'clock and to see again in the morning is uh, what kind of problems are there, what are the risk factors, why is the um, patient, why does he have a delirium, etc. So just for us also to know what are, what can be the side effects of the Dormicum, it can be uh, apnoe, bradycardia, hypotension or even cardiac arrest. So if you work with it, you always have to know what is the antagonist? The antagonist of the Dormicum is the Fumacinil. It's called Anixate uh, in our uh, <coughs> pharmacy. So we said before that the patient didn't have any alcohol problem, that the cage was below than two. If it's two or higher, and we suppose even that perhaps he has an alcohol abuse synd syndrome. So here the treatment, um, we have also guidelines. And also here, uh, we have a prevention if, the, if there is no delirium. So um, we can do trimester in the reserve. Um, and we always have to give them uh, vitamins, the thiamine and folsäure, always. Um, I think that um, it's often forgotten to, to give patients um, the vitamins. And if there is a delirium, then we can work with um, Timesta. If there, is, there are any hallucinations, then we can also give Haldol. And of course, um, always with the vitamins. And if he is uncooperative, we go back to the other treatment form. So what can we or the nurses do to prevent the delirium? We can reduce the stress of the patient. We can uh, try to give uh, equilibrated nutrition. Then, of course, the sufficient pain man management, then a regular night and day rhythm, uh, mobility and orientation and, uh, um, is very important for the patient. Why is the delirium so important or why is it so dangerous? Um, because, of course, it can lead to incompliance of the patient. That means if the patient doesn't take his med medication, if he pull out all his drains, um, then um, the hospitalization length, of course, is uh, getting longer. Uh, he can fall. Um, it can lead to long-term cognit cognitive deficits, and it even can uh, lead to mortality. So here you see a study where you can um, see that patients with delirium stay longer in hospitals, as you can see. And here you see that the survival rate of patients without delirium is um, higher. Um, and what I didn't know, uh, what I think is really interesting, is also that here you can see that in, um, in the studies that had a long follow-up, uh, they showed that uh, after discharge, one year after discharge or longer, most patients um, showed cognitive uh, limitation such as uh, memory dysfunction. So thank you and thank you for your support.